and ready to go. So welcome to the ICD-10 readiness webinar. So the first thing you might ask is, you know, what is ICD-10? It's, it's the diagnosis portion of uh, claims or, uh, or documentation that, you're, that you all have to do in order to document visits and get paid by payers. Without ICD-9 or ICD-10 codes, payers are going to kick your claims back. So when we ask who needs to learn ICD-10, um, I've got a little picture of the doctor up top because we don't want any providers thinking, I don't really have to learn this. I'm just going to let my staff uh, do this. Really, anybody who comes into contact with an ICD code, whether, you know, whether you're at the front desk and you need to have a, an ICD uh, code in order to, to get a, a referral going, or whether you're uh, trying to add it on to a, a, an order so that the, the lab can do the lab test, or your biller um, getting a claim to go out, or just the provider, just simply documenting a note. Everybody basically needs to learn ICD-10. So in your practice, who needs to learn it? Everybody. Now, to different varying degrees and different um, expertise, of course. But everybody needs to be aware that there is a, a change afoot. And uh, it, come October 1st, you're going to be needing to be conversant in ICD-10 for most of your payers. And, and so the question, why change? Um, our, our government is driving the change. We're trying to uh, keep up with basically the rest of the, the medical world. Everybody else except for the United States is, and maybe not everybody, but 99% of everybody else is already converted uh, and using and has been using ICD-10 for, oh goodness, a dozen years. And so just like we asked who needs to learn ICD-10, what areas of my practice will be affected, you know, actually virtually every area of your practice is going to be affected. So you just want to kind of step back and think about what parts of my practice do, does a diagnosis come into play? Because wherever that is, ICD-10 is going to have its, its fingerprints. So now the, the question is, do I need to test? Do you as an end user need to test? And the answer is, no, you don't. That's all been handled for you. But you certainly can test. And I'll show you how to create your own uh, files, and you definitely want to talk to all the different stakeholders, and we would welcome um, additional inquiries on how to test and how does something work and making sure things are going to be um, working properly for you. Don't assume anything. Um, if you haven't read it in the documentation or heard it from us, please ask it if you're thinking about it. And, and the last question on, on this slide is, will my workflow change? And you bet it will, because we're going to bump into scenarios where you've got old codes that are coming into play, and you need to, to kind of map a new code for that. Um, if it takes longer for a visit to be documented or it takes more steps to have a, an authorization put together, your workflow is absolutely going to change. Now, will it have to change in a negative way? No, it, it definitely doesn't. The, the change, like any change, once you master the, the principles behind what the change is requiring you to do, it'll all flow naturally. And I'm sure somewhere down the road, you'll begin to forget what ICD-9 even was. So let's talk just a bit about ICD-10. I mentioned that we're trying to keep up with the rest of the world, literally, 20 years ago, most of the rest of, of the world adopted and started using ICD-10. Um, one recent example, if you look at uh, sunscreen, the United States is about five years behind um, approval of some very new, effective, low-cost, safe products that uh, you know, aren't, aren't as big a risk factor to your health, and we're lagging behind. We haven't, the FDA has not approved that. And, uh, one of the one of the things um, is is just that the uh, testing to to look at results from other countries it, it's not an apple and an apple it's an apple and orange so there's just a lot of work involved so when we do make the leap um, 
we'll see some benefits that, that come out of it. And, and, and mostly they revolve around being a, a, a medical player in, in the whole world. Um, ICD-10, as you probably most of you have heard, is an expansion of codes. It's, it's literally um, fivefold of, of the codes plus a little bit. It's going from 13,000 to right now 68,000. And that number is going to keep growing and growing and growing. Um, so that means that you are, are going to be stuffing more codes into everything you do. Um, so the, the, that's why we had claim forms that expanded from four to uh, eight and, and uh, electronic claim formats that expanded from 10 or 12 to literally 99 um, different ICD-9 codes that can be involved. So there's going to be just more, more to choose from and quite often more codes applying to a specific encounter or a claim or whatever you want to, to, to classify the, the task that you're doing that, need, that requires you to pull in the ICD-10. Uh, the last thing that it, it would be helpful to know about ICD-10 is to, when, when you take some, some kind of basic coding classes, to start to become familiar with the nomenclature. So in our old ICD-9, we all were pretty used to this three-digit base, and we would add a fourth or a fifth digit as we got more specific about um, a a diagnosis that we wanted to apply. And we were generally comfortable with, if we saw something that, for example, started with a 250, we knew it was going to be in the, in the world of, of diabetes. Same thing applies here. The first three characters are going to help put the category of the disease in your frame of reference. And it's not, um, it, it didn't just incorporate the first three digits of ICD-9. It was not possible to do that. So in, in most cases, like 99% of the time, they're going to be entirely different. There are a few stragglers that actually did have the first three letters uh, being, being the same. So the, the middle four, or the middle three characters, four through six, um, go to uh, the manifestation or a site-specific or severity. They just further explain, just like the two digits suffix did, they further explain the, the three digits. Um, and then there's a seventh character, which adds additional characteristics of the encounter. Things like uh, an A would be a, a, the seventh character if it's an initial visit, or a D if it's a subsequent visit, or maybe this particular diagnosis is really secondary to everything else that's going on. So it might have an S for sequela. But the point here is that the way the code is configured um, is based on a, a specific rules. And once you become familiar with those, it'll actually help you to um, infer what a, what a code might necessarily be. So before I go on, I want to just do a quick check. Is everybody hearing me okay? Um, do you have any questions at this point before we kind of start to dive into a little bit more about what's in Care Tracker? No, any, anybody, are you hearing me okay? Okay, good enough. Just need <laughs> wanted something. Okay, so let's let's talk about probably the number one thing on everybody's mind is what is this going to do to my cash flow? What's what's going to happen? What are the billing considerations that I need to to be thinking of? Um, and and the first thing is that um, Care Tracker um, has already performed the testing. And I'm going to pop out real quick. There is a document that uh, we'll have on our website uh, in the, along with the different recording items that we have. It's also available in Care Tracker if you go to uh, the document module under, and I'll, I can show you where this is. And this is the ICD-10 readiness statement prepared by Harris Care Tracker. You notice it was last updated on March 2nd. So as additional testing is performed, if it's required, this document will get updated. But it just goes through what was done, what's covered, and it, it talks about some of the changes in Care Tracker that are there to handle ICD-10. So the reason I point this out is if you have any stakeholders who are um, needing documentation, you know, is your, is your system up to snuff? 
you can provide them with that readiness statement uh, as a starting point for your discussion. But the quick answer is yes, Care Tracker has performed full end-to-end -end testing, not only with CMS, but with uh, any individual payers and with their uh, clearinghouse, the uh, Optum Insight Clearinghouse. Another thing that um, Care Tracker does, and I'll also show you this, is it allows you to create an ANSI 837 file. So if you've got a particular payer that you need to, to test with, um, you could create the file, and you could either run it through um, a, a clearinghouse that they want you to, or send it directly to the payer um, for them to incorporate into their system. So if, if you've got any payers that are sticky and they just want to see a file, there is the ability for you to do a, a test file on your own, and I'll, I'll show you what that's all about. One of the best things that Care Tracker has done to get you ready for the conversion and to, to give you some tools is there's what is called dual coding capability. You literally can see side by side the old ICD-9 code next to the new ICD-10 code. And one of the things that we recommend is that you turn that on and um, have your providers dabble with it a little bit. Pick a couple of patients that they see a lot um, that you could actually start to look for what is the corresponding ICD-10 code that I would need to include. And again, I'll, I'll show you when we go into the product exactly where you can do this. They've implemented, they being Care Tracker, have implemented a new technology, the IMO um, diagnosis uh, technology. It's something, it's a third party. They've purchased it. Uh, Care Tracker's purchased that and incorporated it into the system for you. It allows for uh, bi-directional mapping. It has some pretty cool uh, search capability where you can drill down. Again, I'll show you all that in, in a second. So as far as testing goes, um, we've done it for you. If you have the need to do additional, it can be done. On the training side, there are a bunch of opportunities within Care Tracker. You definitely want to look and think outside of just the application. Uh, payers, your um, um, malpractice insurance company, uh, the different um, uh, organizations that you may uh, belong to for your specialty, CMS. I would go wherever you can get additional training to learn about this. It's, it's going to be time well spent. So Care Tracker itself has live webinars. This session is being recorded. Uh, there's also documentation in help, um, and the, the recorded session is, uh, is coming soon. And you can always call us uh, for some personalized training, and we'll plan on doing some more webinars as we get closer. And there's another tool that uh, may prove useful to you, which is Encoder Pro, which uh, with a subscription you can get full uh, mapping assistance. So there, there's lots of things that, that you can do, and if you start now, um, hopefully you can, you can get ready. So let's, let's talk about the, and I've, I've listed billing items that need your attention, but it actually transcends just billing. But the, the thing that you're going to need to do um, is to update your encounter form. Right now, uh, everyone's encounter forms are full of the ICD-9 um, codes, and you're going to end up needing to be able to use ICD-10 codes. And one of the things about the encounter form and ICD-10 codes is that it, it, it really is something that you need to begin to think about embracing the electronic super bill. If anybody is still on a paper super bill, you might want to uh, give me a call outside of this um, webinar just to discuss what needs you might have. Anybody who's using the online visit or the encounter form electronically, you're going to have a lot of built-in help that's going to that's, that's assist providers and billers in finding codes. Um, payer edits, uh, if you think about the, the different scrubs that go on in the, in the system, they are used to using ICD-9 codes. Those are being updated for you behind the scenes. But if you've created any custom edits, any claims manager edits that are custom, you're going to want to take a step back, look at what you've done, and you may need to update those for ICD-10. 
the, uh, the different carrier directives, the, the national and local carrier directives, the LCDs and NCDs, those are going to be updated by CMS. Um, if any of you are using an advanced beneficiary notice, the ABN, to um, let a patient know that the services are not going to be deemed medically necessary and not payable by Medicare, an integral part of the ABN is the diagnosis code that's going on. So um, you're going to have to make sure that when you, after October 1st, if you're providing the patient with an ABN, which you need to do at every visit if you're using it, that you're incorporating the ICD-10. Authorizations, same thing. A lot of the authorizations are going to be specific to a diagnosis or diagnosis group. Um, an important thing you're going to want to do is look at your top. ICD-9 codes, and we're going to show you a report that you can use. Our recommendation is that you look at your top, and you pick the number, 20, 30, 50, 100, the codes that your providers use more often than the others. It would be worth spending time now to identify what the uh, choices are on ICD-10 codes, keeping in mind it's not necessarily a one-to-one -one relationship. Uh, there are also some payers that are not going to be converting to ICD-10. Work Comp is um, the, the biggest payer that I'm aware of, and there may be some others that, that crop up. One of the cool things about Care Tracker is it will allow you to always use 9 or 10, and there are some settings to allow you to force a specific payer to use a, a specific code set. Uh, and the last thing, and this is something that you might all want to do today, uh, turn on the, uh, the dual coding function. Okay, so um, almost ready to start showing you a little bit about Care Tracker, but a few more things first. Uh, clinical documentation. So this is where your providers are either using point and click or quick text, or they're perhaps uh, using Dragon to dictate, or they're just typing it out. But it, it, it's in some form or fashion, they are creating progress notes that are describing a patient encounter, what they did, why they did it, and an integral part of that is the diagnosis coding. So the ICD-10 codes come into that clinical documentation, and we want to make sure that your providers are aware that some of the codes they're going to use are going to be very specific. Um, even to the point of, you know, where did this happen and, and when? A, a slip and fall, and it might be as specific as the kitchen. Whereas before, the providers might not have really cared that the patient injured themselves in a parking lot or a bedroom or in the gymnasium. If the code is um, getting that specific, they're going to need to make sure that their documentation is as specific as the codes they're using. If they don't, they could be in a scenario where their documentation does not support the code selected. So um, it, it, it's almost common sense, but it is worth making sure your providers are, are aware of that. Um, another thing that's kind of a, a big deal is when you are bringing up a progress note and you're creating it for a patient who's been in previously, one of the, the functions that is there to, to save you time is to pull the old codes or the ICD-9 codes forward. And um, that's going to create an issue for providers that need to be reporting in ICD-10. And if they don't like clutter, they're going to be um, trying to figure out what, what code needs to replace the other one. There are some cool things with some side-by-side -side, uh, display of the ICD-9 and ICD-10 that will assist you in this. But this is probably the one thing that you want to think about um, and talk about with your providers. How are we going to when we have a patient come in on October 1st, how are we going to not make your life even more difficult by having all these old codes come over? And I don't have an answer for you. Um, it's going to take a discussion between you and the provider. Some providers might just be, you know, I'm just going to look them up myself. The others might need um, a medical assistant or, or someone else, a clinical staff, to, to spend some time mapping that. But this is an area where there's likely to be a little bit of a, a additional time that you, you want to be prepared to be able to handle. And that's that bottom piece. How do you clean up the, the problem list? Um, so we'll, we'll show you what Care Tracker does to give you visibility. 
you're going to need to come up with who does it when. Is it after the fact, before the visit, during the visit? But it's just something to, to think about. Um, some other considerations, and this is these on this page, there are some things that um, if you forget about it until uh, you need it, it might put you in a scenario where you're having to wait many weeks to get uh, something resolved. Uh, one of the areas is around reporting. If you have created any reports, um, clinical queries, anything like that, that uh, utilize a specific diagnosis, those are going to have to be um, updated. All the regulatory reports, um, uh, Care Tracker is working on getting those updated behind the scenes. Many of them do not pull uh, codes per se, but many of them do. Or they use uh, the diagnosis code as part of the criteria and, and they will then have to be updated. Uh, we also have interfaces. If you are using um, either Care Tracker's EMR in a different practice management system or you're using the Care Tracker practice management, you're interfacing to a third party EMR, you want to make sure that the uh, interface uh, is set to handle. And with the advent of 5010, most of the architecture behind the scenes is done, but you just want to make sure that um, when you start passing ICD-10 codes, the other system that is uh, receiving them knows what to do with them, or vice versa. If you're getting asked an ICD-10 code, you want to make sure it's coming in in the right format, in the right space, so you just want to do some testing. Similarly, the interfaces for results with either um, a, a pathology, a lab, or an imaging center, or even the, the uh, if you're attached to Carrillo or another state uh, health information exchange, those interfaces may require some, um, some, some evaluation to make sure that they're set. Again, the, the architecture underneath it all, it's already taken care of because of the changes that we saw a couple years ago with the, uh, the ANSI set getting upgraded to uh, the 5010 format. Okay, almost ready to start popping into a, a care tracker here. Um, let's talk about the different program changes um, that are in place. So we've got the um, administration um, area, and that's where we're going to um, enable dual coding. And so let me uh, let me pop over right now and um, show you how we turn on dual coding, as well as I'll show you the reports that you're going to want to be able to run for um, your top ICD-9 um, codes currently, so you can start to think about mapping them, and also payers that are set for ICD-10. So let me go over to the application here. All right, if I go to administration and in the system, um, I'm sorry, and then set up in the middle area here under financial, um, group diagnosis code settings are, are here. And so you want to make sure that you've turned it to yes. And then you can add insurance companies in the override. It's not necessary because Care Tracker is going to, as payers, are um, set to receive ICD-10. They're going to uh, update this behind the scenes, but for creating tests, you might want to uh, you might want to put a, a few insurance companies set up as either ICD-9 or ICD-10. What I've done on this setup is I've got workers comp, and I'm I'm showing it as uh, needing to be ICD-9. So if I inadvertently do an ICD-10, I'm going to start to get some scrubs that tell me, hey, wait a minute, this payer is looking for ICD-9. Um, similarly, I've got Cigna set at ICD-10 and Aetna set at ICD-10, so it, it, the system's going to be thinking and looking for ICD-10 codes. Um, and then let's go to the reports that you want to run in, in the productivity report section. So when you just go to reports, productivity here, other reports, both of the reports you're going to want to have at your disposal are in this area. The first one is the top diagnosis codes by company right here. And when you set this, you can actually set the number of codes you want to you print. 
and you can um, select a range of dates. So the, what the system will do is go out and evaluate and provide you the top codes with also the, the utilization, so you know how many codes. So you might start small, start with 20, and, and try to get your arms around what the mapping is for those, uh, and then work your way, work your way up. The other, the other report is payers, ICD-10 payer. And this report is just going to simply give you a list of all the payers that Matt, I, apolo I apologize. Um, I've got a request if you could go back into that and show how you got there and just to slow down just a tad, please. Sure. So are we talking about the turning on all of it? I'll, I'll start with the administration to turn on the dual coding admin. And we're going to send out the slide deck too, so it'll, it, it'll, it'll be um, – Information will be there, and we're, we're happy to take uh, calls or, or to-dos to, to answer this as well. But administration, setup, and then in the financial um, area, group diagnosis code settings right here. I click on that, and that's where I would turn it yes or no right there. Okay? And you can add, you can also add it, um, payers to that list if you want. The reports are in the report module, so now I'm going to switch out of admin and go to reports. And both reports you're looking for are in productivity. The FYI, the productivity reports, that's kind of lists of things in Care Tracker, um, lists of fee schedules, payers, things like that. In the other section, you'll find both codes, one listed under I for ICD-10, payers list, the other T for top diagnosis codes, right there. If you haven't checked this productivity other reports out, probably a, a good thing to do. There's some, some helpful stuff in there. If you ever like looking for a list of, of my users or I want a list of my insurance companies, stuff, stuff like that. Um, all right. So let's go back to And Matt, just to confirm, uh these all of these slides will be available, correct? Tony yep, will see absolutely. That. Okay. Everything everything you're looking at is available, and the session is recorded, and you can go back and and play it over as many times as you want. Pause it, slow motion. Although I'm I'm sure that wouldn't help on the sound. Okay, we also have um, a new encounter form. So let me pop over and show you where that is taken care of. So the New encounter form, is, it, a couple of things about that. Number one, the old encounter forms, you can, now that we've on the, we're on the new release, you cannot modify those. Those are kind of locked in. If you're going to make changes, you now need to incorporate the new encounter form. And Care Tracker had to take these encounter forms and they had to sunset them because if you can imagine people using the old uh, encounter forms and then having difficulty getting ICD-10, uh, codes into their claims, uh, that, that would explain why. So they sunsetted the old encounter form and new encounter forms would be found under administration, setup, under financial, there's this encounter form maintenance. Now if you look at the list, this list in, in the training company, you'll notice that from allergy all the way down to the bottom to ZS, everything, those are all built in the old encounter form. And therefore, I cannot edit them. I can click on here all I wanted. I could preview them, but that's it. You'll notice the top one, test new encounter form, that happens to be built in the new encounter form mode, and that one I can edit. So we've got um, basically, and this, I'm not, not trying to do training for this, but a real super quick overview. Once you pop in, there's going to be four sections. There's the general setup. What is the size? Do I wrap codes? What's the, the, the font? Is it uh, three, three tables or columns or is it two? And then headers and footers. Um, this is going to tell me what I, what I want to display in the header and I can uh, change my, my company address, phone number, all that good stuff. The procedures. This is where I would create procedure categories and groups and this is where I would add new procedures. So right down here is where I'd add a category. This is a section, a category. This is a, another category. 
this is another category. All of these would, would represent sections on your um, encounter form. And then within each of those sections, over here on the right, these are the codes that I can add. And you'd, you'd look them up here in the CPT code section here. You can add blank lines. You can add formatting. You can uh, move them around. You can delete it if you don't like it. And then on the diagnosis, uh, what's notable here and what's very new and very different is the concept of grouping. And so the reason that we want to be able to enable grouping is that this is an electronic drill down of, of the ability to see more than just one code. So we'll actually go look at, um, at, at this encounter form. And, but just for a frame of reference, what you might notice is I've got all these sprains right here. These sprains, these two sprains roll up under the, um, the other sprain. As opposed to down here, I'm not using grouping. So essentially, if you've got anything in this grouping area here, it is not going to be part of your paper super bill. It is only going to be a drill down capability. So let me, let me actually go to the schedule and show you what I'm talking about here. So. I'm going to do, um, let's see, we're just looking at encounter form. We'll do a visit here. And this is just one we threw together for the demo. So over here on the, on the diagnosis, you'll notice that I've got this bone, um, I'm sorry, this sprain here. And there, it's got this little arrow icon. That's the drill down. So this is the grouping. The top item in the group is showing. If I want to see the other items, I literally have to drill down, click the button, and now I'm seeing those other grouped items. So the, the concept here is that if I'm dealing with a paper encounter form, you'll notice on my diagnosis codes, I only see that, that top code. There's no there's no ability on paper to drill down. And the idea of the grouping is I'm trying to save space. If I'm going from 13,000 codes to 68,000 codes, and if my encounter form previously had 50 diagnoses listed on it, I might need to be able to now accommodate 100 or 150 or 200. And it's going to be very, very difficult to squeeze all that in on paper. So if you're currently using paper, Give me a call if you want to talk about what is involved in, in switching over. If you're currently using the electronic visit, you can start to think of taking advantage now of this grouping. And uh, we're going to have some sessions, some training sessions on building and counter forms. Um, and they're already, uh, Care Tracker has recorded sessions as well as live sessions as well. Another possibility for you is maybe you just don't want to deal with it. You just want us to rebuild your encounter form for you, that is also a possibility. So, um, but put this high on your list. Identifying your codes, your top ICD-10 codes, and rebuilding um, your, your encounter form. Okie doke. Um, I should mention too that Encoder Pro, is, I don't know if anybody on this call has used it, but it's a the coding software that, um, Ingenix has had for, oh goodness, 20 years now, and it allows you to do some wonderful things like find out what exactly is in the edit and why your code may not be payable or mapping uh, from 9 to 10 or what an, a payable amount is. If you want to use Encoder Pro, um, it, you can enable its full capability within Care Tracker. It requires a subscription for, that you purchase, I'm sorry, from... Uh, care tracker, but it, it is there. Okay, so let's, let's now change a little bit and look at um, a visit note entry. So what I'm going to do is go back to the live um, care tracker, and I'm going to show you searching in both a visit and in a progress note for the ICD-10 codes. Right, so I'm going to go to care tracker and I'm going to use and this existing we'll pull Annie into context actually 
I need to do this. Sorry. We'll use mine. Okay, so I'm going to first start with uh, a visit, and of course you could go from the schedule. Everybody who's doing EMR is cringing, going, please go from clinical today. So I'll pop over to clinical today. And if we launch into the visit, which I'll do from here, and I'll put a code on here. So one of the first things you'll notice when I go to the diagnosis tab here is you notice how it's got ICD-10 icon right here? The reason for this is that we've taken Cigna Healthcare, who's the insurance, and I have um, turned on the ICD-10 for, um, for Cigna by going to the uh, dual coding and putting Cigna into the, into the list that I want to start using ICD-10. Keep in mind that this, as payers are going to become come on board and do this and make it mandatory, that ICD-10 um, icon is going to show. So right now I only can turn it on if I put it in the list, but when it's mandated to use ICD-10, it, it's going to be there as a, as a reminder. So one of the things I want to show you is when you, when you do a search, and I'm going to do two searches. I'm going to do one by the um, ICD-9 code. So we'll start with the 883, and we'll do a little search on this. So now we're looking at um, a, a wound. You notice that I've got this view mappings icon. Not every single ICD-9 code that you search for is going to have mappings available, but where there is a, a relationship that, that they can display, either a one-to-one -one or a one-to-a-couple, you're going to get this, this view mappings. So there's a couple ways to do it. I, if I want to pick uh, one of these codes and click on the view mappings, it's going to bring up, after a little wait, and it's interesting, when I was doing this before the webinar, it took almost no time. But uh, with GoToMeeting going, it, it's taking a little bit of time. But here are the, here's the mappings from an 883 Point one. So here's the code right here that I'm, that I'm checking, open wound of finger complicated, and look at the possibilities here. Um, looks like um, the 883.1 that I've picked has a whole bunch of choices. So, I mean, you're, if, if you think about it, this is probably one of the worst uh, examples or examples with the most choices. But one of the things that it's going to take some time to do is get your arms around well, which one of these do I need? There's so many, so many uh, choices, and there are some instructional notes here. The yellow note uh, and the and the green note will will give you additional um, items. And and I actually am not positive what the green and yellow indicate, but uh, once you start doing a little bit of the mapping and try to decide which code is going to be appropriate for you to put in your list of new top ICD-10 codes. Um, you, I'm sure when you're getting to the point and you're trying to decide between one of these two, um, it's going to take a little bit of due diligence on your part to figure, figure it out for sure. But I wanted to show you from the visit, you can search um, back and forth ICD-9 to ICD-10. Um, another thing that if we pick both a ICD-9 and an ICD-10 code and we have dual coding turned on, this would now put this claim into a position where if I needed to create some test files for it, I could. Um, and I'll show you what, what's involved with that. On the visit summary page, you get a, a, another place where coding might come into play. You're getting the reminder that ICD-10 is, is what we should be using. Uh, any questions on the visit? Okay, I'm going to show you a search now for um, Cancel that. I'm going to show you a search now instead of for a uh, ICD-9 code. Let's actually search for um, a word. So foot sprain, and actually I might be I might be wanting to do this in the progress note instead. Yeah, I'm not going to bother with it here. 
let's launch over into the um, oh the I, actually the one last thing the tree right here this would come into play so this if I were picking the um, the sprain of the ligament this is where I created that little nested um, buried drill down if I wanted to pick something in the drill down um, you'd have to invoke that little arrow and then you pick one of these and when you select that it now will throw it into the um, into the diagnosis list at the top so you'll see it right at the very top here okay I'm not going to save this I'm going to exit out let's actually go into um, a progress note here so we'll launch into medical record and if we want to go into um, progress note and we want to be where the diagnoses are going to be present so that's going to be um, the plan, assessment and plan, um, the, the different areas where we're actually picking today's diagnoses. And so in this particular instance, I want to search for um, text. So let's do foot sprain. And so you'll notice when, when, when you search uh, for ICD-10, sometimes you're getting these plus signs here. And you've got a display side by side. Here's the 9 with the 10. And if I click on the plus sign, this is where we're going to get the IMO um, functionality that I, th I think is, is really cool. So used to be that you just have to look at a list and you try to have to figure it out. What you have here is some um, smart filtering. So I know I have a foot sprain. And I can, uh, if I start with, well, is this the first encounter? Is it a subsequent encounter? Is this a secondary uh, diagnosis? Kind of, you know, it's related, but it's not the main cause. When you pick an item on any of these lists, it will start to filter. So if I say, yep, it's the initial, what it now has done is everything on the list that didn't end in an A for initial encounter took it off the list. And now if I'm going to go, well, you know, it is the, it's the right uh, ankle. Suddenly, I'm at a point where there is now only one choice. So if you if you show your providers the the in the progress note, the search the advanced search capability, and anywhere there's a plus sign, they're going to get some added um, assistance in picking the code. So when I when I want the code, I simply click on that what, what was left there. So just another tool. Um, this one geared at providers as opposed to billers. Generally, the billers are going to be thinking in terms of just codes. The providers might be thinking in terms of the condition, the disease, whatever the symptom is, and trying to get to a code. And that's where that IMO advanced diagnosis um, uh, search is kind of coming into play. Okay, so let's uh, go ahead and pop back over to the presentation. So, so we just discussed visits and progress notes and the IMO diagnosis search and the side by side. I think oh the problem list. I want to touch on that. So if we go within um, within a patient chart and we're looking at the problem list, one of the things we've kind of noticed looking at everybody's um, not everybody most everybody's use of the EMR problem list is kind of a, a turning into like just a, a huge mess. And so what we want to make sure that you guys are aware of is that if you are kind of trying to manage and inactivate things that, that aren't um, coming into play, keep your problem list smaller instead of bigger. Um, you're going to be in good shape. Right now I've only got a few active um, problems on the problem list, but this view has given me everything. If I want to look at just the, the chronic problems um, there's going to be my list now anywhere what I want to draw your attention to thinking about the problem list is anywhere I see side-by-side -side codes with a comma you you already have both codes kind of in the problem list and available for the doctors so those those are not going to be the the issues the ones that are going to be the issues are the 
ICD-9 codes in the problem list that are active that only list an ICD-9 code. So what you're going to want to do is you're going to want to start mapping um, and thinking about your most often used codes. And when you get into a patient's chart, you're going to want to be picking both the 9 and the 10 so that when you are having to convert to ICD-10, you're going to have some of the, the, the codes already in there. Um, again, this is for you to talk to your providers and figure out knowing that the end result after October 1st is I have to submit claims and I have to have my documentation in ICD-10. And today we're in ICD-9 only. And I get from point A to point B. You're definitely going to want to take your patients that are coming in regularly and deal with those, um, those charts and those problem lists. And, and to start to pull in the ICD-10 so that when you hit the ground on October 1st, you've got some of this legwork um, accomplished already. Um, dashboard is the other thing that we want to talk about. So we went, we went to the dual uh, coding review and we turned that on. I'm going to go back to the dashboard for that. So it's, again, administration. It is... Uh, that, I'm sorry, home, the dashboard I haven't showed you yet. Dashboard is in home and management. So this is a new place for it. This uh, previously wasn't there. This over on the right staff measures, you'll see dual coding review. So one more time, if you have turned on dual coding, administration setup, and I've turned on my dual coding, then any claims that have both ICD-9 and ICD-10 uh, codes on it can be reviewed in the dashboard under management on the dual coding review section. So I've got one in here, and uh, it, what we see is, again, side by side, I've got my ICD-9 um, code next to my ICD-10 code. Is that right? That's not right. I've got my ICD-9 codes here next to my ICD-10 code here. Apologize. And if I needed to create a test file, this is where I would click on the uh, on, on the 837. I've got to um, make sure I've notified Chair Tracker that I want to do this. I haven't in the training database. Um, when you've got uh, testing available to you, then you can click on that box and generate an 837 file. Again, most of you probably never need to do this, but if you have a payer who wants to see IC. Uh, 10 test file or a dual code test file, this is where you'd come to do that. And this is also a good place to just give you an idea of, of the uh, different claims that the, um, the providers uh, or different charts or encounters that the provider has done dual coding on. And if you've created any uh, test claims, then they would show here. Uh, I don't think, no, being a training database, I haven't created any. Okay, so uh, the other thing, oops, wrong. So in terms of the program changes, um, you're going to want to turn on dual coding. You're going to want to start to become familiar with the IMO, the advanced search. And if you do start doing dual coding, you're going to want to uh, know that in a dashboard, you can review those claims. Um, Markham is reviewed. You can... Uh, create test files. Uh, basically, it gives you a little playground to be able to, to, to work these a little bit more. Okay. So the toolbox that Care Tracker has given you um, is that the dual coding, the encounter form, uh, allowing for, for payer overrides. Within the visit, you're going to be able to have that icon showing you whether you're looking for nine ICD-9s or ICD-10s. That will become important as you get closer, um, especially after October 1st, when you're trying to remember which payer wants nine and which payer wants 10. That little code is going to be the reminder. Uh, you want to make sure that if you um, have taken the time to map codes and you've built your new encounter form, that you have the uh, drill down capability. And, and that you take care of, you take advantage of those nesting, those codes. Um, the, the progress note using advanced search, being able to, to map forwards and backwards from 9 to 10. Um, 
I should mention that Care Tracker is going through and, and trying to remove um, nodes that are tied to ICD-9 so that basically everything you do with diagnosis codes is done in a search mode or a favorite mode rather than a template mode. Um, we want to make sure you're aware of the, the dashboard for the, for the dual coding. Um, I didn't mention or show you this, but cases uh, now has the ability to um, uh, have different code sets. And then the testing, Care Tracker's done that for you, but you can generate some 837 files on your own. So places to go to get training. Uh, you can go to our website. This session that you're viewing right now will be recorded. We're also going to have up there um, this slide deck. There's also going to be a slide deck that uh, Care Tractor put together. That's much more uh, um, specific at 65 slides. Wouldn't hurt for you to take a peek at that. Anybody who was at last year's um, uh, Care Tractor conference um, already saw part of that slide deck. Uh, but you can also call us for one-on-one -on -one training. Help is getting updated as we speak. And if you were to look at dual coding, um, you'll actually uh, see that there is uh, uh, help right now in the user guide for that. And then Care Tracker is offering live webinars that, uh, that kind of tackle what we just looked at with a much more Care Tracker, Care Tracker um, centric approach. I was kind of talking about the practice and concepts and things that you need to be aware of. Uh, the care tracker sessions are going to be drilling in and, and might help you if you're ready to go in and do encounter form maintenance or you want to uh, see what was, how did I do that dual code testing again? I would definitely consider joining some of those. The next session is tomorrow. It's full. There are still two other scheduled sessions, one June 16th and one June 25th. Uh, get, get, registered for that if you want to join one of those. Okay, so here's your, here's your, your checklist. What, what can you start working on today? Uh, review your top codes. Try to start thinking about um, mapping the different ICD-10 codes that you're likely to be using based on your top ICD-9 codes. You're going to need to tackle the new encounter form. It's come October 1st, that's going to be the only way you're going to, you're going to survive. Um, if you're using ABN, you just want to be ready. If you've got any of your practice letters that, that pulled in ICD-9s, you're going to want to create an ICD-10 version. Um, if you are um, dealing with the, the acuity of, of diagnosis codes for, say, Medicare Advantage, like primary care docs are, um, you're going to want to, to, to think about well, do I have an ICD-10 uh, list of, of the different codes that impact my RAF score? Uh, you're going to also want to um, identify any payers that you deal with that are not moving to ICD-10. Uh, Care Tracker should be taking care of most of this behind the scenes for you, but if you're proactive and really uh, engage with, with your payers, um, read the literature that they send you. Um, identifying those that are not going to move to 10 uh, could be very important. We want to make sure that, um, that when you're trying to code your progress note or your claims, you're using the right code set. You definitely want to engage with your providers and staff, getting them to go to training sessions. Not only the care tracker training, but coding in general. Um, there, and there's lots of opportunities for that um, in, out there, and, and a lot of them are free. The reviewed clinical, uh, reviewing clinical workflow, this is that discussion with your provider. How do we get from the ICD-9 codes that are in my problem list today to ICD-10 codes? Um, and we, we're happy to, to give you our two cents, but it's going to come down to who do I have in my practice that's capable of it, who has the time, what, you know, how, how proficient will my providers be? Uh, and I can't tell you what the right answer is, but through discussion with your staff and your providers, hopefully you can come up with a, with, with a game plan. So that's all I have. I noticed that we were starting to approach the hour and we had uh, a lot of people were kind of bailing. Do we have any, any questions from anybody who is still on the call that uh, they want to see something I didn't show you or have questions about something I did show you?
Um, Matt, this is Tony. Um, uh, Matt, there was there's... one question. Okay, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead, Bruce. Uh, there was there's a question about the cost of encounter uh, of Encoder yeah. Pro. I put that on the uh, chat, and that was one thing I wanted to um, let Matt know that um, a couple of the people are asking about getting Encoder Pro again, which is fine. And um, sure. I talked to Love, and I what I'll do is I'm going to send the brochure out, and then what the subscription runs. Um, Excellent. Yeah. I'll send it with this information that you're going to send me. Um, Perfect. You know, the PowerPoint presentation so that they know. Okay. Yep. So basically, Encoder Pro's got three levels. Tony will have the pricing and what she sends out. Um, there's a, a, a the highest level, which is like expert, is close to a thousand dollars. Unless you're um, dealing with uh, real big compliance type issues um, or um, have a, a, a heavily surgical practice where almost every claim is a, a search in and of itself, not positive that expert is what you'd need. The middle, the middle um, product is in the $500, $600 range. I can't remember exactly. That's, yeah, that's it's probably. Okay, and that's probably what you would want. That has all the dual coding. <laughs> Um, mappings to it, and then the low end one. Um, I just, you can look at the features and functions. I just uh, when I looked at it, I thought I I I'd, I'd rather not have it than have only that functionality. And that low end one's in the three hundred dollar range. So hopefully that answers that question. Any other questions? And hopefully everybody remembers October 1st is our target date. Um, I truly do not envision uh, this one changing. Uh, they really, I, I think we saw a couple recent votes in Congress that kind of led, led most of the experts to believe it's going to happen. And um, as you can see, if it happens and you're not ready, it, it could be um, a serious amount of, of work in October to try and get your claims through and paid. So definitely take it seriously. Any other questions? No? Okay, well thank you everybody. We appreciate everyone's participation. We will uh, post this webinar on our um, website. It'll take a day or two to get it up there, but thank you for your attendance and we look forward to seeing you on future webinars.